So today's uh, presentation was really going to be two last segments, really kind of pro quantum problems and practicals and then quantum machine learning. Um, and upon further inspection, um, I think that we're going to skip this one, the seventh one, the quantum machine learning, because um, I don't know that it really fits this conversation as well as I'd like it to be. It kind of veers off uh, for its own sake. So we're going to stay here and spend most of our time here. And then if we need to go back uh, for for Alex, we can we can pop back into um, simple quantum algorithms too to kind of do that. But this um, is quantum problems and practicals. And really, it was meant to, you know, in the spirit of, of learn by doing just to kind of uh, take those folks who haven't who've gone through the series and are saying, okay, let's, what can we really do? Like, show me quantum doing something of interest and, and, and where it actually gives a quantum speed up. Um, and so that's what we're going to have, have a look at. We'll look at a, at really a deeper dive into just four things. So we'll, we'll look at um, solving log logic problems, one called the, uh, of kittens and tigers, this great little, uh, a little project there and then that's sort of the the narrowly focused of what we call a um uh, uh boolean satisfiability problem and then we'll take a look at the general case and solve both of those quantumly uh, we'll look at a, a at a little bit of a deeper dive use case study we call it the quantum spy hunter it's, it's indigenous to the book um, but we're going to take it apart piece by piece and kind of see how that goes there's some good nuances that can be teased out of that that i think are are, are useful to have a look at and then we'll take a, a a variant look at Grover's search algorithm uh, vis -vis amplitude implication and why that works. And we'll look at a number of, of frameworks in that uh, to do that. So that's kind of what we're gonna cover today. And so if you like logic problems, and uh, and most people do, there's one called Of Kittens and Tigers. The basic idea is a father comes in with his brilliant daughter and says, I have a present for you. I have gotten you a kitten. And she says, great. Uh, the, the only problem is that I've put it in one of these two boxes. And uh, the other box is a man-eating tiger. So you gotta figure out which one it is. So there's some caveats to this, which we find fairly interesting. So at least, so there's messages on the boxes. So um, at least uh, one of these boxes contains a cute kitten. The other is a ferocious tiger, we know that. And then the notes on the boxes are either both true or both false. And this sort of gives us a, a problem to solve. And so um, what, we can do is devise a digital solution. And uh, when we looked at digital logic and how that cascaded into um, uh, regular circuits and how that undergirds quantum circuits, you know, we know that we could use and and ors and nots and nor gates and all these other crazy things to develop a solution for that. But it's gonna take um, a number of iterations to see which combination gives us a one here. Uh, and that that tells us uh, which one we we want because the 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 man eating tiger is, comes out as a zero and the cute little kitten comes out as a one. So um, what we would tend to do is for is use OR gates and and XOR gates and things like that. I'm not going to bore you with all of that, but the the digital solution of that uh, I've come up with in circuit first, and we can pop that up real quickly. And this is that exact gate, and we can. You know, if the red light goes on, then we know uh, we have a winner here. So if we put a one there, oh no, that doesn't work. And and actually, what we get stuck is the zero zero um, kind of um, uh, use case. So if we put a one here, it doesn't work. Put a one here, that doesn't work. Um, but if this goes zero and one, now we know that um, that this is the combination that will give that will tell us which box is the the kitten is in. And so that's all well and good except there's a caveat. The father says, you can't run that circuit four times. You can only run it once. That's where quantum comes in. You know, can we develop a quantum solution that can literally run this left to right uh, in, in incorporating the, the quantum version of, of the digital logic and tell us uh, which, uh, which box to look in for, for the kitten and avoid the one with the man-eating tiger. And the reason we can do this is because those initial boxes we we bring into superposition, and all those four um, those four possibilities are run at once, and uh, and at the end we're able to to do that um, with just one pass through the circuit. So 
we are um, we take a look at that, <clears throat> and I'm going to do. Let's see if I was just going to run this through. Um, I'm going to make life a little bit easier for you here, and I'm going to take this particular URL, and I'm going to open up another another screen so that we can have something that's a bit bigger, and you can see it. Uh, so here's the gate, and um, and we start off with uh, sort of initializing the the gates to zero. We've got, of course, the the two boxes. We've got the various notes and and uh, and the answer down here. So we put it in superposition, and um, this is, if we look up here, this is one part of the logic. Uh, that we're implementing, um, we institute or not, and this is effectively the the quantum version of of that digital solution that we just had out there. And then we we do what's called uncompute, and then do the Grover mirror, and we find that in box number two, there's there's the kitten. So that's how that works. And I think I'm going to have to make this a little smaller so I can get back to where I was quantum problems and practicals. And that shows you how um, that shows you how uh, we can take a problem like that that requires uh, four inputs on and its digital side and on the quantum side we can actually um, we can do it with just one pass. Now the larger perspective here, especially as we get to the what I call the um, more generalized solution, at least for this class of problems, so there's a pattern out there. And um, and when we see those patterns, we know that we can solve those. So it's Boolean satisfiability problems may or may not be practical, but we can look at that and go, you know what, if I see that in the wild, I know I can solve that quantumly and do, and do something good. That pattern really is this. Um, so if there's a Boolean satisfiability problem and we get the statements, usually it comes in the form of A and B and C and D and dot, 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 dot. You've got these independent clauses, uh, and then um, and sort of these uh, these AND gates in between. So the pattern is we can represent these in independent clauses with um, with magnitude logic, and so we put it in superposition. We articulate and execute some magnitude logic on there, and then we push that to a phase logic um, AND gate, and that's where you'll see this in just a minute. Um, once all that work is done, after those things are in superposition, we simply uncompute those. Um, and we mirror those and use the amplitude amplification and and we get um, and that solves the problem for us. So if we looked at a general case um, uh, for this A or B and not A or C and not B or not C and A or uh, C. So for those of you who, who, who didn't take digital logic or logic in college, that's a mouthful. Um, but the, we can take a look at that can be solved. Uh, I've come into circuit first and, and here's the solution to that gate. There's, that's the articulation of it. Let's see if this will let me make it a little bit bigger for you. Um, and you know, initially everything's zero. One of the things we're gonna find is that there's a solution, but there's a solution too. Um, and that may not be a solution, but that, and there's a solution. So there's multiple solutions. So in the, in the case of, um, and we're just gonna kill this for sake of interest. In the case of the generalized one, it may not be that you get all the solutions or the best solution, but you get one. And so in that, um, and of course it can only be run once, so we can't we can't go fiddling around with all the various inputs to figure out which ones which configurations work properly. Um, the quantum solution kind of looks like this. You know, again we have these clauses that are represented in magnitude logic, um, separated by uh, phase phase logic, which is your AND, and then um, then sort of the um, the inverse or the uncompute part of that. So if you have something here, you uncompute it over here, and at the end you mirror it, and that's where you tend to, to get your results. So you start seeing something like this. You know, you set the project up, the problem up, um, you execute some logic, and you start seeing some of the 
things that we've seen last time where you've got phase changes, uh, and then we amplify those and we get an answer. Um, and we'll see this in action when we get to Grover's algorithm more and more, um, but that gives you an idea of actually why it works. So um, we could take this one, and I'm going to, let's see if this worked, 10, 3, 10, 3. You get used to these minor tweaks after a while. And this is the, um, the larger problem that we had there. Uh, I'm going to see if I can give you all a bit more of a gander as to how this works, at least from a visual point of view. So these things are going to get really small, uh, maybe not that small. But we set the problem up. We've got a number of gates here. Uh, we put things in superposition, and we start running the clauses through. Uh, the various clauses in, uh, in, in the way that they're implemented. Um, this is our, our major AND gate. And then we in first, uh, we uncompute those. And at the very end, uh, we do what's called a Grover mirror, and out pops the answer. So at least it gives you a, a visual feel for what the behavior under the hood of some of these more sophisticated um, algorithms and, and how they behave. It's a worthwhile study. Uh, as you're going through to see how some of these work in the simulators because there's so many ways to kind of tweak in there and see what's happening under the hood. And it really goes uh, quite a long way to, um, to develop intuition uh, around how, how those algorithms work. And that's really what we're after. So that's a quick sort of um, run through of that. <clears throat> uh, we're gonna get down to uh, one of our more meaty kind of case studies. And that's called the quantum spy hunter. And what we're uh, interested in doing is teasing out some of the nuances of, of how this solution gets implemented. Uh, it's really more for academic purposes uh, in teaching. And um, the, the sort of setting up the context here, this is very much like quantum key dis, uh, distribution in, 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 its, uh, in its space and flavor. Um, and here's how the, sort of the context gets set up. So we have Alice and Bob that are communicating through a quantum connection. And they're sending information back and forth. Um, and they want to um, figure out if anybody's eavesdropping on them. Standard stuff, you see this all the time. Uh, and so what they do is uh, they, in this communication process, they will uh, send out what we call tracer signals. And that is a signal that is random in nature, that if there's an eavesdropper, um, out there that is, uh, is eavesdropping, uh, there's a very, very, very small chance, less than the, a certain percentage of a million that he's actually going to get it right. Uh, most of the time he's going to get caught. And so that tracer signal is a way for these guys to just kind of check. Is anybody listening? You know, and what this case study is going to do is uh, show you how that gets implemented and, and pull out, tease out some of the the, the nuances of how that gets implemented, because it's an interesting case study. There's a lot of very interesting things going on in the hood. The very first thing I will tell you is that by looking at this, um, this uh, circuit here, you cannot, absolutely cannot tell what's going on. You just can't. It's just, it took me a while to tease out the nuances. I had to look through the code pretty heavily um, to do that, and, and you have to as well. But I did try to draw some pictures, and that will help us to understand this. So we're going to go through this step by step. I'll give you the big uh, context first, and then we'll start teasing out the nuances of each individual step as we go on. So the big picture here is that you've got Alice and the connecting qubit and Bob, sort of a standard scenario that we have. Um, what you don't see is that Alice has got these has got a, 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 a randomized qubit that she um, pulls two values from. And those values are going to be um, um, known only to her. Uh, and we'll be checking those will be the values she'll be sort of passing along here. Um, but then with these other two qubits, <clears throat> um, if she, she, these are random qubits here. So there's a randomized value. It'll be 0, 1 when they get measured. There's another random qubit here too. That'll be a 0, 1. So we've got really one, two, three areas of randomness here. And when they all line up, that's when they, um, that's when the check occurs. So it's you never really know, and you'll see that when we begin executing this thing. But there's a value that gets set here, 
and and a header mark gate that gets here that gets set here and you can't tell this because it's implemented in the code but those are are executed based on the values of these two qubits here so if this ends up being a zero there's nothing in here if this ends up being a zero there's nothing in here uh, these are both ones then there's these both get uh, implemented um, and these basically allow her to um, set a value and then pass it along uh, the uh, the um, uh, communication channel so that happens here, and we're going to go into this bit by bit. This is sort of the 10,000 foot view. And then there's a spy. Now, the spy always runs a Hadamard gate through the, the, the uh, message he steals. And he has to measure it. Now, if you remember, you can't copy qubits. So this is a no cloning rule gets is what's securing this, this communication pattern. Um, so he gets this. He reads it. He doesn't really know what he's reading. And then when he's done with that, he doesn't really know how to replicate that. So he's taking a chance. And sometimes uh, he'll put a not gate here. Other times uh, he, he won't. Um, and then puts it back on the wire. And most likely uh, the, he, he will get caught every time. Um, and so that comes back down here. They begin to read it again uh, to what's un, what we call uncomputing. Uh, and then uh, they read the value. So this is sort of the 10,000. Uh, foot view. But let's have a little bit more of a detailed view of how this works. So you've got three qubits. I've got Alice, the fiber, and Bob. And they have their, um, Alice has uh, has some randomized qubit. There's another randomized qubit here. If this is a one when it's measured, then, then this uh, is executed. If this is a one, this is executed. Otherwise, they're blank. Uh, the qubit gets tossed on the circuit, and then the spy takes over. Now, the spy can't copy this. We know that. Um, and he's always going to execute this Hadamard. It's just part of what he does. And uh, depending on what happens here, he's got to make a guess. Well, did I get the right information? And then how do I send that off? And this is where the spy gets caught, really. Uh, but he does this thing. Sometimes he puts a, uh, a, a, a not gate here. Sometimes it doesn't. And then puts it back on the wire. Uh, and then the rest of this thing goes through. We, we sort of continue the processing and then read it out. And what happens in this is the following. So um, if the, this is the best way to kind of view this, there are checks and balances. So these are randomized and this is randomized. And if this um, particular phase and this particular phase match, now they match in this case because nothing's happening. You'll see and as we run this that there'll be head mark gates applied in both those places. But if they both match, um, then we perform a check. If they don't match, we simply don't perform a check. It's just the way this thing uh, is, is set up. Um, and then if they do perform a check, then the value that gets articulated here, whether it's a one or zero, um, gets stored in a, a, um, a variable. It has to match the value that gets read here. And if it doesn't, we know that there's a spy out there that picked up this thing, tried to figure out what was going on, made his best guess and put something erroneous on the line and we detected it later. Think of it as tracer uh, signals that that get inspected every so often. And, um, and in that inspection, if they don't jive, if there's something wrong, we know someone's listening in. And the rest of what we're gonna look at is just the, uh, the detail of all of those. So um, let's just go do that. So there's uh, two random bits that get generated. Now, what you don't see until you look in the code is that there's another qubit out there that is random that um, got measured and the values of that got, um, got um, stored in, what we, in these two variables, uh, send had and send out var uh, value. And they'll be used later on to check things. Um, so Alice prepares her, her payload there. Um, and then um, she sends the qubit. So depending on what values these are, these two functions either exist or they don't. And in this case, they do because they're both one. Um, so she executes a not gate and then head of gate to encode it and then puts it out on the wire. Um, when she does that, there's the send part of it. Uh, the spy gets activated. Now, because the no cloning rule is in effect right now, 
the only thing the spy can do is read the qubit um, and then try to carefully send one just like it to Bob so that they can he can avoid detection. And mathematically, it's just not going to happen. Um, but that's all that he can do. You can't just copy those qubits. And that's the security of this. And it's a very simplistic uh, example, but it works. Um, so the spy pulls the qubit off and then uh, decides whether or not to put um, uh, to apply a NOT gate to that and then uh, and puts it back on the wire. And then what the receiving qubit does as well is there's another Hadamard gate which introduce, introduces more randomness over there. So these things have to match in order for it to actually check the tracer, the tracer qubit um, or the tracer message. And if all that lines up and, and it does, then uh, they can decode the message uh, and then they can read it. And if there's, if there is, um, there's not congruence. In other words, let's say this particular piece and that particular piece uh, match, whether it's nothing or whether there's a Hadamard gate in there, then we can check, then we can perform the check. Um, but the values that gets articulated here, if they don't match with the value here, we know we have a spy. And this is the gate, this is the circuit for the quantum spy hunter. So retrospectively, um, this is where I think some of the nuances are useful, and we'll run this so you can actually see the slide. But, but um, by just looking at a circuit, there's no way you're going to know everything that's going on. You have to inspect the code. You have to understand what's happening underneath there with the code. Uh, the more complex it is, the more dense it gets. Um, and uh, you need a lot of different tools to gain intuition about how these various pieces are working. So let's go look at that. And I've done that actually for you. I've preempted that. <clears throat> and that's over here. Um, and so we have a gate. Let's just kind of move that around. And the easiest way to see this behaving is I'm just going to rerun the program. And then if we catch a spy, you'll see a little something out here. So let me do that. Um, let me just make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. That should give us what we need. And I'm just going to run this a few times see if we can catch a spy. And we caught a spy, right? So, um, so this and this, these two spaces right here, match. There's nothing in them. So the nothingness matches. And then um, the value that gets articulated here does not jive with the value that we have here. So now we knew that a spy was listening and, 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 uh, and got it wrong. And we can run this again a few times and see if we catch another spy. And you can see the the circuit changing. Oh, caught another spy. Um, so here we have um, nothing here and here, but that matches here. So these both match with nothing. Um, and then the value pulled out from here doesn't match the value that we have there. Now we, we know we've got a spy there. Um, so that's uh, a, a quick case study into the, the quantum spy hunter. It's a very interesting, uh, enlightening project to try to get um, some nuances around and, and wrap your head around. Um, and I, I found it was, it took a lot of time to kind of dig into it, but it is definitely worth the time to kind of look into that. What I'd like to do now is to turn to have a little bit of a harder look at Grover's search algorithm. The, the idea of the amplitude ampl amplifications loom large in this space. And, um, and this is another really good, um, helpful example to look at, to get a feel for, for this kind of space. So um, if you were to have an unsorted, the basic problem is if you have sort of an unsorted um, database and you need to find uh, one item in that um, unsorted list, how long would it take you to do that? And so normally um, the classical approach is N over two evaluations, uh, which is on the order of those of you who are computer scientists out there, big O of N. Um, and by using a Grover's algorithm or a quantum approach, we can bring that down to O of square root of N, which is a significant improvement in time. And so what I wanted to do for those of you who aren't used to big O notation, um, 
uh, this is one of the things you learn in design analysis of algorithms in computer science class. Um, there are some really terrible algorithms that um, that behave in these formats. So the, as the input uh, rises, the um, the time it takes to complete those operations or the space it takes to sort those operations gets very, very large. Um, so there are some really bad algorithms. You don't want to use those. Um, there are some terrible algorithms. You don't want to use those. There's some bad ones as well. There's some fair ones, there's some good ones, and some amazing ones, which I think is this little tiny sliver down here. And so this is sort of those the lineage of there. Um, so O of 1 execute you know, in the same time, uh, regardless of input size. And, and further down, um, big O of 2N, uh, the growth doubles. And then uh, there's all sorts of other uh, aspects here to pay attention to. But this is a, this is a really key thing for, for us when it comes to evaluating the, the behavior of algorithms. So let's take a look at this unstructured search case. Um, you have a list, just a standard list, however many digits long. And somewhere in there, there's something you're after. Uh, but you don't know where it is. So in this case, we're going to label that W for winner. Okay, and um, and if, on average, if you were to search this in a classical way, it's sort of n over two boxes, right? Um, in worst case, you have to search them all. So you sort of get the average. Uh, what we're interested in doing is trying to get that winner quantumly um, in much fewer steps than we can with a big O of square root of n. Uh, and that's a significant improvement. Now, one of the interesting things that happens is like this list has an internal structure. It's a list. It could be a link list. It could be an array. It could be, you know, a Python list. It could be anything, but it's a list and, and it's an ordered list, although the elements in there are not ordered. So there's a zero, one, two, three, four, all the way to the end, but, but these things are definitely not in sorted order. So the quantum approach doesn't make use of this internal list structure. It ignores it. That's why it's so powerful. And, and what they really do, <clears throat> and I think this is what um, is fascinating about this. When I first uh, took a look at this, I realized we weren't in Kansas anymore, and there's some really interesting things happening over the hood, is that it leverages this the idea of amplitude amplification. The kind of thing we're looking for in the, in the passes as we go through this algorithm tend to stand out. They rotate, the, 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 the fancy phrase is you rotate around the mean and all this other kind of stuff. I won't burden you with that, te that terminology right now, but... But through the various passes, you can see that the, um, the one you're after sticks out more and more and more and more. And so with a fair amount of certainty and a, and a, and a smaller number of, of searches, we can actually find what it is we're looking for. So let's look at a little bit more of a concrete case, just a quantum search over two qubits. And so <clears throat> um, if we um, use an oracle function before, um, then, then we can we can make good use of this. Um, and what I'm going to show you first is a different process than before, uh, where we you can sort of get a visual, and, and really in all of this, the idea is how do I parlay an intuitive understanding? How do we? What tools can we use to gain a more intuitive understanding? Um, many times we want a visual understanding of this. And this is one of them. It, I think it works fairly well. We'll look at a few more, uh, mind you, but we'll start with this. So we'll define an oracle and, and what that oracle do, it'll make a phase change. And, uh, and this is uh, in the, the two qubit, you've got zero, zero, or zero, one, and zero, one, two, and three. Uh, in this qubit, it will make a phase change. That will be our oracle. That's what we're trying to uncover. Um, <clears throat> we'll execute these in order, how to mark eight, qubit A, how to mark eight, qubit B phase flip, and then reverse order, and you'll see what it is. So you'll see at the end, we'll have found that particular qubit um, and, and, and have used amplitude amplification to do it. So let's have a quick look at that. I've teed this up for you. And um, so here's the Oracle. We're gonna click on this Oracle function. And what that really did, I don't know if you can see it there, was it instituted that phase change right there on this particular um, uh, range. And then we'll execute a Hadamard gate against that and watch what happens. Now there's some magnitude changes around that. We'll execute a Hadamard on the second qubit as well. And then we'll flip the phase. So there's a phase flip. 
execute another Hadamard gate <clears throat> to uncompute. And then one more. And there's our guy. That's the one we're after uh, in the exact uh, order as well. Um, so that should give you a little bit of intuition <clears throat> on the behavior of that. Uh, and, and I think that's fairly useful. Let's go down and look at this from another angle. <clears throat> let's look at it using the QC engine. Uh, let's, I'm just going to do this. And I'm going to go over here. And we'll run this over here. So let's just start with this. You know, we'll put the, the qubit in superposition and we'll execute our oracle. This is what's going to tell us what we're looking for. So the oracle is right there. <clears throat> and we'll do our first rotation. We'll do our second rotation. And uh, we'll go ahead and flip the phase again. And you can see that there is a, a, a C phase in there as well. That's, that's in, that's, that's, that is um, executing some uh, interference, positive interference. And then we'll uncompute. And there we come back with our answer number two. Two, which very closely, which exactly correlates to um, the answer we got up here in this gate right there. So we've looked at it from from two different mechanisms right now. Um, I want to look at it from another one. <clears throat> uh, let's look at it from QS kit. So we're going to, I won't bore you with the details or burden you with walking through the, the, the actual function, but let's just run that real fast. And then we've got oracles we can create. We can create a zero, zero oracle. We can create a zero, one oracle. We can create a one, zero oracle or a one, one oracle. And in this case, I'm going to stay in, um, in uh, uh, consistency with everything we've done, and we'll do a one, zero oracle as well. So we'll go ahead and click on that. You can expect to see this gate when we come out, uh, uh with a CZ gate. Uh, there. So we'll run that. And um, then we will do a final display of the state. And then we'll actually run it on the back end, <coughs> submit that job, print out the state vector, <coughs> which is going to not tell you much of anything at all until we normalize the vectors. And we see the result is there. And we print out the um, circle plots. And of course, we get a two here. Now, if we really wanted to go back, um, run this again just to show you that I am not cheating. <clears throat> um, we could do zero, zero. And let's do that. Whoops. We'll run this one. And then we'll come down <clears throat> and finish the circuit. <clears throat> As you can see, it's changed. We'll submit that to the back end, and then we'll print out the normalization vector. It should be zero, zero, the zero, zero spot, and we'll look at the circle plots for intuition, and there it is right there. So we know that's working. Now, the other thing that I want to try, now we've looked at it from a number of different perspectives with different tools that all give us a different perspective on to how intuitively this thing behaves under the hood. Um, I would like to do Grover's algorithm, search algorithm over three qubits uh, with a completely different um, framework just to see visually how this works in a larger perspective. And, and there is a quirk in the way that this works, so I'm going to have to go outside of this. And this is uh, over three qubits, um, and I'm just going to run this right now. And this is a fairly large um, uh, setup. So but I give this to you so you can see what happens when things get a little bit more complex on a, in a visual sort of way. So we're just going to run that, that through, uh, start that whole process. This one takes a little bit of time. Is it for three or four qubits, man? Looks like four. Um. Three qubits because one is a scratch qubit. And, okay, and that, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and that threw me for a loop too when I first did this. I'm like, why? It looks like there's four. <clears throat> One's a scratch. And there we have it.
And so that is the that is the answer. And from a visual point of view, that <clears throat> gives us more intuition on the behavior of these things. And I think that's that's fairly useful. Um, so just wrapping this up, <clears throat> why don't we look at how this works if we did this in Quark? So I, I think the Quark example um, is really kind of useful because we can set up a bunch of qubits. Um, we can measure those in unique ways. We can provide an oracle to it. Uh, so really nothing's happening here until we give it the oracle. And then we um, we we can execute some, some other gates here. And we see down here that we have an amp of just the beginnings of an amplitude amplification, right? Now we don't know what this oracle is, but we but we can see the beginnings there. <clears throat> you know, it's in this case it's decimal 27, right? Um, apply the oracle again. Again, we apply the same things in that. So here the 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 rawest percentage is 25 and change, right? And now it's up to um, where am I? 60 and change. Do the oracle again. Uh, now we're up to 89 and change, and we run the oracle again, and we're up to 99.918. And so having looked at it through you know, the same kind of type of problem in, um, in Quark gives us yet another visualization of how this, this works. And, and this is important to gain in, intuition. That helps us when we start working on very complex problems um, and, and things like that. Now, I think you all are gonna be very surprised at this next thing, but that's the end. That's that's literally all I have for for this group uh, tonight in this space. Uh, it's one of those things that took a long time to kind of put together, but to run through it in presentation mode uh, actually happens pretty quickly. So, to Mr. Terrell, um, what would you like to do? I'm going to punt the ball back to you. Uh, well, the pressure's on. Uh, <laughs> Well, I just have one comment just for the free flow. I'm really happy because last night I talked about BB84 at a very, very high level. And you brought it down a level to the actual implementation. So I want to talk to you about that some other day. Okay. The piggybacking there, at least because of that process last night, uh, I kind of understood where you were going at a very, very high level. Anyway, so uh, more importantly, any questions, thoughts, comments? You guys, the microphone, I think, is on. Or yeah, I, have open. A, I have a question. Shoot. So, I, I don't know if this, um, if this is a valid question or not, but, hmm. you know, we, we have seen and we've gotten comments from even our class at MIT about um, the use of the Oracle, right? It's almost like you're putting the answer in, and then you're basically reading the answer. Um, how? Well, that's where I think the disconnect is. You're guessing the answer. You right. So you. So I think maybe that's where you can kind of explain, or maybe someone else can kind of weigh in. In in a practical, you know, in a practical example where you really don't know the answer. So I don't know if anyone has done this or have they tried it. Where is is there a is there a way where you have a problem that you can have the problem create an oracle where you really don't know what that oracle is and then use the growth algorithm to measure it and to guess it? Has there been any implementation like that? I'm gonna uh, politely punt that to the group. We've got some pretty sharp minds in the audience today um, and I would uh, I think there's more than a number of folks who might have vision into that. Um, I could go to my old um, standby keeper, uh, but there's some other folks out there. Amir's out there. Dan Stubbs is out there. Um, there's a number of folks. Alex, so my picture of it is you could use for the Oracle any kind of uh, Boolean logic function. So for example, along the line of what Matt showed us at the start of today's discussion. Um, <clears throat> so in that case, you don't actually know what the answer is other than having specified it via a, a set of conditions. Um, and so effectively that Boolean logic will output a one at the end of its circuit 
if the conditions were met and then um, effectively when you run that over the superposition of states which is all the different states then it will select out and flip the sign of only those ones that satisfy the conditions which could be more than one result it just depends what the conditions map to but yep. so in that case i don't think you're actually um sort of hard coding it in well other than indirectly via specifying a set of constraints but that's more or less the definition of saying i don't know but this is what i want you to tell me yeah i think that's i think that's a fair answer and um i mean i think it also goes towards the direction of a ram right so if this is a database where you have some value stored it would be like you're doing a query and you're saying you know where's you know where's the answer you would have the satisfiability problem already coded so you know in the case of a database you have if it's a, a database of names for example and you're looking for a name you already have the names in the database and then you say where is this name right so you already have to have something stored already and then you search for it. So in this case, I think one has to have the Grover's, the, um, the satisfiability problems already stored in like a QRAM and then maybe do a search for it. So the Oracle is really the QRAM in this case, right? So all the other way of thinking of that is because I don't think you actually need to have that result stored anywhere in like a type of RAM. Um, effectively, you've got a function that's mapping from the state X, which is represented by the number of qubits that you've got in binary. And it's mapping that to what you would call the contents um, of that memory cell. Um, and that's exactly that Boolean function mapping. Yep. Um, and then it tells you the result. So it is, as you say, it's not searching by like memory address so much as memory contents and then saying, here's the contents that was the correct answer. But again, what I don't think you need to picture it as being pre-stored, you can think of it as being calculated on the fly <coughs> for every single memory address in parallel. Um, and then that being used as the value to compare with. Okay, yeah, thanks. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it, I think what, yeah, I, it does make sense. And um, since, you know, I played around with it a little bit, um, almost been like six months ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, I got to a point where um, the question really was, how do you, you know, how do you store some information that you can search for? And um, because, you know, your satisfiability problems become, the, the, the algorithm becomes very complicated if your satisfiability problem, even you, if you make it, even an interesting problem, your your um, quantum algorithm becomes quite big to implement a satisfiability problem of any size. Yeah, and that's exactly the big problem that to do anything useful, your program becomes so large so quickly that it doesn't fit onto either a simulator or real hardware. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I don't have an answer to your specific question, but as a way to frame a way of thinking about it, and I think Matthew mentioned this um, during this talk, is um, it's it's um, so the way I'm, I, I look at the Oracle is it's both maybe a computing function based on the inputs plus the uh, what satisfies a correct answer, so how it can tag the answer. That will then get amplified in later parts, you know, as you as you do multiples of those. So, uh, but one way to frame it versus classical, a classical approach, is 
to think about it of how many times am I querying the Oracle? And I think that's a general thing with most of our quantum computing algorithms and was established with, uh, you know, Deutsch's work initially was, um, am I querying this Oracle function less than I would classically? So, yeah, so when I'm just offering that as a way to frame like comparisons of why there's value in this. Um, but, you know, in the case of how we learn Grover's, we're really just looking at how do I find an index given all inputs? Because we're not actually uh, computing. I mean, you could recode other problems into that space, meaning that if you could uh, use each individual state to mean something. Um, but then that's, that's that data loading problem, because if you could encode into uh, the discrete states of, you know, that you, you get with your superposition, well, then you've just walked your whole list in order to encode it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, going back to the QRAM, that's where that, that uh, plays a much more significant um, factor. But um, yeah, here's one more way to think about it. Let's say you, you utilize more qubits. So now you're not, you're not necessarily looking, and let's say you have a real function. So rather than the Oracle being, hey, I just wanna know when I'm looking at state uh, 18 or 27 in this case, but you actually have more qubits um, and you compute some function over those inputs. Well, then I think things get a little more interesting because you're, um, um, because you, like, if you think instead of like each individual qubit being an index, you can think of them as registers. So let's say you want to compute some function over uh, four bit registers. So what's cool about superposition is if you, let's say you have four of those variables and you want to know which one of those four is, uh, is the answer. Um, you would put everything in a superposition. So you'd have four registers of four qubits, you'd have 16 qubits, and then you would have, your Oracle wouldn't just be, I need to identify index, you know, uh, X. It's that I'm gonna compute something with those four qubits in each register, and then I'm gonna tag the correct answer from that, and then you'll get out, um, I think something more meaningful. So that would be taking Grover's a little bit beyond and uh, just this, you know, the prototypical way we learn about it. Um, I don't, it would probably be better if I like sketched that out and drew that out, but um, I was just kind of uh, doing that ad hoc in my head. Yeah, I mean, I think I see, you know, it's like a building block, right? I mean, to, to really create a complicated microprocessor, a quantum microprocessor, we have to take these little pieces, little smaller processing units like Grover's algorithm connected with something else, connected with an Oracle, connected with a QRAM and keep it all in superposition because you can't measure anything in the middle, right? But if everything is in superposition and part of your logic was if this value is this, then give me some other answer, then it would be, Grover's algorithm would be a good component in between without giving you the answer, it would just do amplitude, um, amplitude amplification, lead the superposition into a certain direction, and then eventually you use that to get to your eventual answer. I mean, it's complicated stuff. <laughs> I don't know yeah. how we're going to build complicated logic out of this. And Matt, kudos to you that you're having Anthem staff <laughs> learning this stuff. That's great. I don't know how I would get any of my, you know, the companies I've worked for, they couldn't even do business analysis properly. So I don't know how <laughs> you're getting your team well, to talk, talk to me in, uh, in, uh, in December. I'll let you know how it goes. I see we have Sanjay's got a hand up. Sanjay got Hi, a uh, Yeah. Um, so looking at the last example you gave of, of Grover's algorithm, um, I, I um, in that example, uh, you know the the, uh, the database size was relatively small, so 99.9% um, uh, you know certainty of, of finding the right result was you know reasonable, but if you have a database with more than millions of of, uh, of data points, 
um, that 9.9 percent would not be certainly not be um, acceptable. So would the answer be to add more oracles, or what? What's the? I mean, you know, in the real world, we need 100 percent certainty when we're doing search. So what's what's uh, the best way to do that using using a Rover's algorithm? So <clears throat> I think that, and I will. I'm going to give you one perspective, and then I'm going to what we call punt it to the greater group for input. Um, punting is a very good thing, especially in, in something like this. But um, when you look at, let me find this for you. I think it's just a matter of a certain number of passes. Um, so, you know, when you look at amplitude amplification, two things happen. One, the element of choice tends to grow. But the coloroi is everything else tends to shrink. And so there's a combination there. Um, and we that's sort of a visual for us uh, to kind of see. Um, but it happens in, in uh, um, unique ways under the hood. And so I think your question was, well, this is all well and good because we've only got, you know, a small number of qubits. But can these, and these have to be viewed as numbers of passes. You know, would that, would you need more Oracle passes for a larger database or not? And, um, and I would think likely not. Um, so I'm going to throw that out as a, as, a, as a statement and see if the greater group either agrees with that or not. But I think there's a certain number of passes. And I think those number of passes tend to end up, well, I mean, the math that we're looking at here uh, is always going to be relative to input size. And I believe we said, wasn't it um, O square root of N uh, in terms of, of of passes. Um, yeah, so it says requires an average n over two evaluations. That's classical. Yeah, this so, is about to create, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so there, there is an optimal amount of evaluations you have to do um, for amplitude amplification, and I think if you go beyond that, you actually start losing amplitude. So you start Correct. going the other direction. And it should have been mentioned somewhere, but yeah, I, I mean, I know we were getting the formula. Grover gave the formula to us, <laughs> but I don't remember it. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually covered that in the one presentation you, you missed. Yeah. So. Okay, I'll, I'll look on, on uh, YouTube. So just, um, so the there is a theoretical uh, optimal number of um, Oracle passes that any given um, algorithm would, would require. That's basically what you're saying. Yes. Yep. And if you go past that, you begin to get diminishing returns. Right. All right. Thanks. I think Matt, uh, what I, I mean, when I read Grover's algorithm quite like a few months ago, what it looked to me like it does not really translate to um, the way we search in the modern database world. The way it, it <clears throat> the one of the objective that I found about Grover's algorithm is the speed. Like in, in, in <clears throat> existing database world, if you are trying to, so suppose you have M data elements or N data elements, then you need to probably execute like the search at least N by two times. That's that's what you're saying, right? Classical. Yep. But when you are, the, what Grover's algorithm tries to prove is if you use the quantum um, uh, computation the way it is explained, then it will take a root, I mean, a root of n number of, you know, iteration or something. So that's that's where it, it, it is the main crux. Like, it's not exactly saying that this is the optimal search or you can always search 100% right. But if you apply my algorithm, then probably you have your algorithm and search, etc., will be a lot more fast. And then comes the correction part, the error part, like whether you're 100% right or not. That, that's what I believe what I understood last time. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. That's where this that's where this uh, big O of square root of and comes in. Right. I mean, we are far, far away from really turning Grover's algorithm to be a real, real life database search algorithm. I mean, database search algorithm is way complex than uh, the Grover's algorithm says. I mean, it's totally different world. Yes. So I mean, really, I mean, just trying to. Um, you know, extrapolate the database that we work on our daily daily life with the Grover's algorithm would be real difficult to explain. Agreed. Yeah, that's my so, 
to you. Um, Just got some feedback there. There we go. David here again. The, I think, Sanjay, to expand on your question even a bit further, there are two things that we need to think about in terms of uh, like getting a probability of 99% that, and wanting total certainty. So the first one is the number of iterations of the Grover algorithm that we need to do to get it up to 99%, which is what we've just spent the last few minutes talking about. And that varies as per um, the number of qubits that you have or root number of qubits. The, but then completely separately to that, once you've achieved the fact that you can get the right answer with 99% confidence, how do you make that 100%? And I think the answer there is, well, if, you, if you're going to measure something and get the right answer 99% of the time, like if you were to measure it 10 times, say, and you get the same answer 9 out of the 10 times, then you can take that as the correct answer and you, you're pretty close to 100% certain that it's right. Um, so effectively, a, if you're taking a, a few more, if you run the algorithm a few times and then take the answer that comes back most often, then that will be the correct answer. But those extra times that you need to run it or query the oracle um, don't change that order of magnitude that Matt was talking about. And that's why it stays the same despite you getting close to 100% certainty. Well, I think, I think it could also be that the use of quantum computers is probably not going to be for precise calculations. It might be for averages and probabilities. Um, you know, if you want to do a precise calculation, then you would use a classical computer you want something to give you a quick result and give you a directional result uh, with probabilities, then maybe that's where the quantum is. I think this has uh, been a very good discussion. I've had the question was where you get the oracles, but I, I wonder if it's not the case that when you get to the 99% uh, probability, you can resort to the classical search and uh, just confirm it that way. So it's, it's like uh, figuring out the divisors of a, of a large uh, two prime uh, multiply together. Once you have the answer, you can confirm it very quickly. The hard it, it, Dan, sometimes that would work and sometimes it wouldn't. So yes, for factoring, you can check the answer easily, but if the question was, find me the smallest number in my database, and I tell you, well, the answer is 10, then you can't easily check is 10 the smallest um, without looking at every single value in the database, so which is back to where you started. I see, so there's no classical way of, uh, of checking it. For some problems, for some they definitely Oh. I mean, the way, the way I imagined, you know, some algorithms as we were going through our course, um, I imagined that, let's say you have a very complicated map, uh, you know, a graph, a map, where you're trying to, dis you're, you're going through a number of cities and you want to get to some destination. And with, um, with like the traveling salesman problem, you can accurately calculate Let's say you've got two choices, left and right. With the, you know, with a classical um, salesman problem, you could go through the graph and you can calculate exactly the the distance if you go left and distance if you go right, and you know maybe they're they're two different values. Um, with with something like uh, um, a quantum algorithm, what it would probably give you is there is a 90% probability that this direction will be less, less time and 10% you know, probability that this direction is gonna be you know, more time. So 
I think that's the kind of answers we're going to get. Now, does that mean that if you go in this direction, you actually take less time? Probably not, but 90%, you had a probability of 90% that if you went this direction, you would take less time. So I think it's going to be probabilistic answers, quick answers, but not perfect answers. I think to add one more thing to Alex's point, it's a very good example that you give. Um, in classical case, right, for a classical salesman problem, for each route, the computer has to compute it individually. And then it has to finally calculate what is the <coughs> least expensive route, right? But in case of quantum computer, it can calculate all the possible routes at the same time. That's what probably is the power of quantum computation. Yeah, so but I think one that, have to accept that your answer isn't going to be a perfect answer. It's going to be a probabilistic answer. And right, right. And in that case, probably you have to use the classical uh, computer to decide which one among the final data output that Quantum has given you, you should choose. That's when the classical computer probably has to chime in. But um, calculate all the possibilities at the same time. That is when Quantum does. And then once it generates the result, that goes to a classical computer. And then from there, you decide, okay, this is the um, you know, least uh, traveled route, yeah. something like that. I mean, so I, I will tell you, we were having a similar conversation with our team about when, you know, like a number of assets increase to the point where you cannot simulate that on a classical computer anymore. Um, at that point, you can use a quantum computer to give you a guess, right? Now, you could probably never validate that classical but that's what you've got. You know, quantum computer can take a huge Hilbert space and give you a directional answer and say, look here. <laughs> now, then you have to figure out, can that lead you to a smaller subset of your problem? And then when you get to the smaller subset, maybe you know when you go left, you can say, okay, now I'm gonna focus my, my classical algorithm only on the smaller problem on the left side maybe maybe use that to validate certain things or move forward but the, you know there will come a point where with quantum computers you will not be able to validate that classically sure i do see i'm going to switch what we call this sort of turn left without turning a blink around we do have a question in the um in the chat that i want to punt to the greater group and that says, can you please elaborate on the Bernstein uh, Varzani algorithm? So uh, anybody, any takers for that? Sounds like something we could try to recruit uh, Matt to uh, do some research on and come back in a couple of weeks. Uh, I've seen it before. I just didn't. I was looking at that to potentially include um, in uh, in the uh, simple quantum al algorithms because it was pretty much in the same fair ballpark to uh, this one. Um, you know, there's a family of those things that sort of behave the same way, but I chose not to, so I don't have that answer yet, but we can look that up for sure. Uh, so I read about the Bernstein uh, Vazirani algorithm and it is what I understood from it was it is basically a generalization of Deutsch jo uh, Joshua um, algorithm. But I, I couldn't fully understand it, so I thought if maybe someone could elaborate on that. You know, um... It's, again, it's been a while, but I think the bernstein vazarani algorithm is similar where you put, um, you put an, al um, an oracle where you are um, using uh, C naught gates to basically say zeros and, um, and you basically set up a value and then you use Hadam so you use Hadamards, then you, you, you fix your qubits using C naught gates to the to values that you want. So let's say you want to have zero, one, zero, one. 
And then when you do your Hadamard, you basically get back the same value. And I think I've tried this in the past. And what it really does is it validates your circuit because if you, if you uh, once you put the Hadamard and then you put in your values, you can't see those values. If you were to just measure after that, you have a value in your space, in your, but you, if you just measured it, you wouldn't get that value back. It'll be random. But after you put the second layer of Hadamards that you see over there, and then you measure, you get exactly what your, your function was. So it's, it's almost like a, it's like a magic trick where you, you, you put in some values, but you can never measure them unless you put the Hadamards. And um, well, what I found when I did it with the simulator and with the actual circuits is that it's, it's because of the inaccuracies, you don't always get your values back. You know, you expect to, you, you program some values and you expect to get them back when you put the head of marks, but you don't always get those back. So I think it's a good way to validate your circuit. And also it's a good way to start thinking about the, um, the superposition that you create with the Hadamards, being able to program some values in with CNOT gates, and then trying to get those values back using Hadamards again. And, and it teaches about um, the preparation, um, the measurement, um, and accuracy of the circuit. And why you guys are going through that, <clears throat> I'm going to make sure I get that GitHub link to you guys as well. So bear with me. So we don't need that. Um, you don't need that. And let's see if I can. Um, straining to see this from across the room. And quantum education. So this is the GitHub repository right here. And I will, can I put this in the chat? Yeah, I think I can. I'm going to put this in the chat. And I, I will update that. I think that's sort of updated. Um, there's two portions to that. So there's the, um, let me just better, better show you over here. Um, what you'll see there, there's the workshop section and then a practical section. So what I'm doing here on the practical side is I'm actually going through this book and we're going through all the chapters of all the problems in that. And this is one of the things we're going to do as we start training some of the quantum engineers out there. Um, and then I'll put, um, and this is not updated, but it's out there. Uh, we'll have a Jupyter notebook for each one of those problems and begin to, to interrogate it uh, that way. And this is, uh, this is one from the QE engine, and we've got some variations of the way we begin to look at that. Um, and the tools we use to look at that. It'll be much the same flavor of what we've been doing, uh, but it will be indigenous to those particular problems out there. So you can see that over time, that'll be getting more and more uh, beefed up. Uh, but so there's really two sections when you get to this GitHub, there's the QC workshop, that's what we're looking at now. And then there'll be this practical section as well. I'll be building that out over the next few months. Um, you know the, the the structure's all there, um, but uh, but you know I've got more, a lot of work to do in this space. So that is um, that URL is in the chat, and um, feel free to uh, have a look at that. You're going to have to set up your own environments at home to to do that. So you're going to have to. I would highly recommend, you know. Python virtual environments and, and making sure you set it up. I do not make that easy on you, by the way, uh, because I don't have a um, uh, a requirements document in there just yet. I don't believe I do. 
No, I don't. So I'm not making your life any easier there. I'll probably see if I can put one in there in time uh, just because that's polite. I'm, I'm not being polite, but uh, I'll see what I can do to kind of get that going. But there you have it, guys. And, and that's going to be a living area. Like that's going to get updated all the time. Um, and so I want to make sure you guys are aware of that as well. Cool. Can you put that in the chat? <laughs> yes, sir. It's already there. Somehow. Oh, did I do that are privately? You... Whoops. Hang on. I don't I know. I did it privately. Let me oh, yeah. That it, again. When you get a private message, it kind of changes the box there. It does. The, yeah. All I right. guess that's a good thing, though. Yes, it is. All right. So that I, I sent it out to everyone. All right. And um, what I would really appreciate from this esteemed group is feedback. You know, like there's errors there. Like I've made errors. I know I've made errors because uh, everybody makes errors. Uh, or there's ways that there's other frameworks that have just come on the market that can help explain some concepts <laughs> a little bit better than, than I have. Uh, and so if you see those things, send me notes. Say, hey, you can, you can do better with this. You can do better with that. Um, you, you made a spelling error here. Or you've made a tactical error there. Um, you know, any kind of input I can get to shore this up and make this tighter, it would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, well, since we have a little bit of time, I'm, uh, I'm curious if you could share, um, it doesn't seem like this is your first rodeo to me. In for, uh, for what? For education. And I'm curious if you, I mean, if you can share a bit about um, what inspired you to teach quantum computing this way, meaning in a very visual way, uh, reinforcement, um, I don't, I don't think you uh, expanded on that at all. I didn't. So let's, yeah. let's, let's do that. Um, and you're right. It's not my first rodeo. So um, I don't think, have I ever really given you my background at all on this, on this? Did we just, we do bet we didn't do background sort of, you know, what makes you tick kind of thing. What, where'd you get your education from and all that. Um, let me do that real quick, just so we can level set. Um, I'm just going to pull up, um, let's see, this should do it. So quick and dirty background. So I'm the Senior Director of AI, Machine Learning, Cognitive Tech, and Distinguished Engineer for Optum uh, in one of their divisions. Uh, there's many divisions, 350,000 people uh, when you include uh, UHG. I was an AI engineer for military contractor before coming here, entrepreneur for nearly 20 years, adjunct professor at DePaul downtown Chicago for almost a decade, won a teaching award. So you're right, totally not my first rodeo. Um, CIO for a dental insurance company, that's a story. Uh, AI developer back in the 90s using neural networks, network circa Windows 95. For those of you who lived through that painful period, a philosopher of decades, education nuts, we've got four degrees, undergrad, grad, classically trained at AI in the grad level, balanced on business and computers in both those spaces. Lots of professional search, data science, machine learning, a bunch in AI and a bunch more in quantum. And in Optum, I wear a lot of hats. So I'm at Education SME, we have a college of AI inside of Optum uh, where we train AI engineers in our space. And I've developed pedagogy for training those guys. Uh, and that was to offset the cost of buying PhDs because they're expensive. Um, senior leader delivery for two and a half years, I built the first global AI machine learning team for Optum. And uh, we saw 260 use cases, delivered 74 projects and saw a lot of stuff really. Uh, I'm a mentor, both internal and external for startups, for technical people for wayward executives who want to learn this kind of stuff. Um, I'm a strategist, so I get tapped for strategy because I got the business and the technical perspective. I can go back up and down the, that ladder, um, talk to the C-suite, and then talk to the line level uh, uh, technologists actually making this stuff. I'm a thought leader, so I have to go out and get new tech uh, and bring it in. Because as you can imagine, you know, the healthcare area is fairly um, robust and, uh, you know, cutting edge in certain areas, but the insurance place is not. And so we're not, uh, we sometimes have to kick our, ourselves uh, to get moving. So I go out and bring new tech in. I've traveled the world, talked to thousands of engineers uh, in this uh, process. 
Um, and I'm a technical SME. You know, I actually do tech. I go out and actually make stuff. So uh, we introduced intelligent agents as a form of AI uh, back in 2016. We used them for self-healing uh, mechanisms in the VMware space because VMware has some hiccups every once in a while. We introduced cognitive technology last year, um, and that's really along the AGI space. So my gambit is really more of all of AI, not just quantum. Uh, but I am interested in quantum because I think that's really going to change the world as we go forward. Um, so that's that. Um, why did I create this class? <clears throat> we kind of touched on it at one point in time, and that is because um, in when you have a business and a technical background, um, uh, and many other things, you can sort of see patterns above the patterns. And one of the things that I noticed was that um, every doggone book that I picked up was dense quantum physics and opaque mathematics that they led with. So they, like, you can't get into this space unless you will invest the time to learn these things. It's just, you know, it's kind of what we do. And I didn't think that was right. So it, I surmise that there are really three camps uh, the consultant camps we're not going to concern ourselves with, but the folks producing the tech who are working with the quantum physics and, and material science to get better substrates and things like that to hold subatomic particles, do better fidelity with, you know, God love those guys, but that's a, um, that's not the group that I was trying to concern myself with. These guys are going to make the tech. And one of those guys, or a few of those guys, depending on what industry you're in, <clears throat> will will win that standards war. And they're going to hand us their product and go, here it is, guys, uh, somewhere down the line. And there's good reasons why. I mean, there's geopolitical reasons across the, the world with the U.S. and China that's pushing this forward. That's a different conversation. But But the bigger group is the consumer group. So these are the folks who are going to take that tech and actually solve business problems or, or in our case, healthcare problems with the tech. Um, and they're being underserved right now educationally. Uh, so they have really two sets of, of requirements. And I've seen evidence of this, especially in the banking industry. You know, they need software engineering skills, which is really what all this is about. And then they need professional consultancy skills, which I'm not attempting to teach. But, but when you take that kind of technology and you interface with the business community and stakeholders and the investment community and things like that. You have to have people that can stand up in front of that group and and um, argue points and present yourself and argue cases and keep on a trajectory and things like that. And and the software space was horribly underserved. Um, and, uh, and as this moves more into the mainstream business function, these professional consultancy skills are going to become extraordinarily important. There is a position uh, that paid extraordinarily well for one of the big banks. I think it was Morris, Morris, Morgan Stanley or something like that in New York City. And the position was like Chief Big Wiggum's quantum. And, and what you had to do was lead the engineers, develop new products, talk to stakeholders, which are business people, talk to investors, um, talk to the media. And that position stayed open for more than a year. Like they couldn't fill it. and um, that was one of the things that led me as a clue that, hey, you know what, this dichotomy exists that um, that needs to be serviced. And if we want to do this, we've got to find a way to train these software engineers to get them access to this material that doesn't cost them the entry price of learning opaque mathematics and dense quantum physics. And so that's kind of where this was born. Um, and there's more to it than that. But effectively, the, you know, we're training these guys. So this is the course we're putting together. We're, we're going to use this workshop uh, to introduce them to it. Uh, we're going to use MITx Pro for theory. Uh, a few math courses, because if you, you need them. You really do need them. Um, and then a whole heavy section of practical uh, to get their capabilities up over time. And what we really hope to do is in this space um, is to move the needle from knowing, you know, no quantum computing to being exposed to it, to getting a solid theoretical and practical background to get them to exactly this point. And that's this one here. That is ready to take the step that the big money is associated with. And that is how do you go out to the greater organization and find those problems that are either quantum friendly or quantum force friendly. And then begin to the of those problems that the enterprise is concerned about. And then try to solve them. Now I mean until our job is actually kind of easy until 
quantum computers get ubiquitous, we're really sitting in the patent and defensive publishing space. That's how we justify our existence uh, to do this kind of work at the enterprise level. Because there's an executive going, why the hell are you spending my money? And you have to come out and go, well, we're getting patents. Well, it's really a few things. So there's, there's patents, there's, there's defensive publishing, and then there's stock price sensitivity. So, you know, a big Fortune 5 company, if somebody goes, hey, Optum's got quantum engineers on three continents and they've got a portfolio of patents out there, um, you ought to buy their stock. Uh, and, you know, worse things like that have happened. But um, so there's a price sensitive uh, sensitivity to that. When we introduced blockchain, it moved the stock price. So this is another one that potentially could. So those are things that would justify our existence. But we can we're pretty confident we can get people through this. But this, all bets are off. Like, nobody has that tackled yet. That's the, how do you go about and actually look for those patterns and problems throughout the enterprise? Then how do you actually go and solve those? And, um, and the guys in this space don't know and don't care. These guys do. Um, Accenture's got a four-year head start on everybody. They have a, they're, they're the market leader in that space. Um, but, uh, but I don't think even they don't have a silver bullet on how to do this. It's still brute force. And I think the ability to present, to ferret out, those patterns are out there. To ferret out those patterns and create a portfolio of patterns is where the, the billion dollar savings, the billion dollar um, um, payoffs are going to be. So that's a long winded, uh, Amir. Um, uh, answer to that question but hopefully that was useful most definitely and uh thank you for sharing more of your background um yeah it's it certainly has come through the materials uh, at least for me i've seen uh like i said i think in a maybe the first one i haven't seen an intro course ticket um, as far along as you did. You know, I mean, how many intros are out there that talk about superposition and entanglement and interference? But um, you know, really getting at the intuition, showing it visually, that kind of thing. So, um, one more question: since you, I don't, uh, since you brought up that slide with the four parts of kind of the progression you see, um, the third box about math. Um, I posted something in the um, in the chat, but I am curious what how you see that box getting filled, um, and like because that one I think is important, and I don't see a lot of resources out there unless you're just going to go take a math class, you know, or pick up a math textbook. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. Um, so there was there's, there's a couple of issues there. <clears throat> I think um, the like if you're going to be in this business, you got to learn math. Um, and as much as the rest of us hate it, um, it it is the oracle. Maybe that's a bad word, but it's the alchemy that undergirds a new way of thinking that will allow us to um, have the conceptual skills to look at problems in the enterprise that we can't see because we don't have those skills. Um, and so I know some math, at least introductory math, is really important. Um, and so I think all we were going to do was just kind of get through a couple of Udemy courses that um, that build foundational materials. My one concern is is to um, is to build practitioners that have a base level of skills <clears throat> that that don't have gaping holes in their uh, in their capabilities that have enough to actually grow. And so the math is important. Um, I, I don't think that we're gonna bust their hump in that space very much. Um, there's a couple of courses in Udemy that are basically 10 bucks a piece that, um, uh, that cover a lot of that stuff. And um, I think we were just really gonna do, do that and then call it a day. That, that math piece is one of the pieces I'm, I'm thinking through for, for the community. Uh, and that's uh, what my complex number series is. Now, I'm obviously not the right guy to be teaching it, but, uh, you know, you start somewhere and, uh, you know, trying to get a handle on exactly what you need to know. Like I taught linear algebra in uh, 
at the university last fall and going through the, the textbook that I was given to use, I mean, it had a lot of noise uh, when, when it comes to, um, you know, all the detail and all the math overhead. You, you, don't, you don't need that much for the quantum space. You don't need a whole semester of linear algebra. Uh, so I'm trying to work through that, that math box there, actually. And, uh, you know, what, what exactly does that look like? How do, how do you, you get it out there? One of the things, if I just ramble for a second, um, if you start out, if you take a new person who's interested in quantum and then just start giving them the math lessons, it's that, that's, that's not going to work. Uh, you got to get to a point where the people are hungry. Like right now, uh, you know, I don't know what all of your math backgrounds are, but right now I think every one of you understand, you know, why you want to be super comfortable with complex numbers, linear algebra and trig up to a degree, et cetera, uh, because you have a reason to learn it. But if you just start the beginners out with, with math, it'll, that we'll lose them fast. Very so there's, fast. A, there's a lot of, you know, psychological aspects with that I'm, I'm thinking through and tinkering with. Uh, you know myself here, but others are are aware of that too. But I, I don't I don't think others are really thinking it as deeply as as we are in this community right now. So um, you know what I mean, it, they'll just throw a linear algebra course at it. Yeah, that's not a that's, that's not a, a way to do it. No, that's not that's not right. So I I will say a few things. So at least on the math side, there's a couple of really cheap Udemy classes, um, prereq, and then some advanced stuff. And then you know I hate to show this to to groups like this because like there's a lot of smart people on this on this call uh, but when you're building uh, folks from scratch you know some of these things are just helpful for uh, visibility and for awareness but I will say this though one of the things that I do when it came to putting these things together um, was um, having done uh, this is engineering the pedagogical process and um, and putting myself and walking through the same shoes that other folks would normally go through. So the pain and suffering that ends up being most intimate is also most common. So everybody's wretched in their life one day. Everybody knows what that feels like. It's hard to describe in words, but you know, once you talk to someone who's wretched in their life, they go, "Oh yeah, I, I get it." Um, and so the the pain and suffering that that folks have coming from uh, from this perspective here is is common. It really is common. And so the idea was that it's one thing to know the material. <clears throat> it's another thing to um, come and lay it out for easy, easy digestion. And that's a, a pedagogical development process that uh, like I would agonize over um, the kinds of things to put out there and, uh, and the order. And, and all of that and go back and forth and change things around and all that because the accent wasn't necessarily just the material. It was the methodical approach to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to getting that out there and um, for easy digestion of, of the, the student. And that helps a lot. You know, one, one thing in that, in the strategy is it's like, think about how you learn a programming language. It's a very iterative process, right? So you start with hello world, right? Oh, good, oh, man, oh, I got Python now, you know? And then, and then you dig a little bit and, you know, it's an iterative process. So for example, I think what we should be doing is you take the math, that's not the first thing, that's, you, you know, you take a little, you do a little hello world action on a quantum computer, you know, you get a random number generator, right? Uh, or you flip a coin rather. So then, then you start to, then you give it a little bit of math and then, you know, you take them along and do some more uh, algorithm design or, you know, what have you. And then you do a little bit more math uh, deeper. So you just don't, right now, the way the structures are, you take a math course. And, and but if you integrate it like that, you know, using math and, and the, quantum computer and algorithm development and you kind of you kind of circle through it I think that's the best way to do it because I think that's the way most of us learn a programming language for example right 
you get something to work, okay, you know, something in Python, the print statement, and then you say, later on, you're like, oh, okay, I need to print an in integer, so how do I do that? Then you learn, you know, about the uh, string function. And then I need to do something else, and you learn about that, etc. You don't learn about, you know, hash, uh, I guess Python's ha Python doesn't have a hash, does it? Anyway. I think it does. Yeah, okay, but it's a, you, you learn it when you need it, rather than you learn all the math at once and then you learn all of this at once. Well, I think that's know, what we have to do in this space. Yeah, then you if learn. you have a, if, if you so, have a why for what you're doing. Exactly, thank that, you. That's the thing. And, um, and, and, and learning math, um, when you have that why, is so much easier because you become, you know, when you get somebody tells you to do a, um, a math problem to learn it, it becomes a chore. But if you're doing a math problem to understand how a complex um, concept works, now it becomes a joy and it becomes uh, an adventure. And that's really the, the difference in that. And that's a pedagogical approach. You know, I, I remember being in college and some of my instructors were horrible. And they were there just to get a job done, and none of us learned anything. And my job uh, in this is to um, is to make a 500-pound gorilla dance, uh, and that's that's the big our big organization. You know, we want to get folks in there that actually will do this. We want to get folks in there who will, at some point in time, get good enough. Um, to engage in this patent and defensive publishing process. That's success for us. <clears throat> and, and we think we can do it. Um, I, can share, oh. I can share a perspective as well. Um, I'm actually actively working on quantum problems. And what I have found is that um, you, know, you get into it, you try to solve it, and your, limita your limiting factor is your math. And, and then you have to figure out how do you solve a specific problem? What's the best code to write? Is there mathematics behind it? Is there an algorithm that can solve that problem? Then you learn those things and then you can move forward. Um, so, I mean, you know, knowing linear algebra and becomes important. Python has become very important. And, uh, and it also depends on for example, if you're solving something for like D-Wave versus if you're going to get into uh, gate models over here. With, uh, with D-Wave, you can get by with linear algebra and just uh, understanding how to create a cubo. And anyone in D-Wave will understand what a cubo is. Um, but you have to convert your math problem into something that D-Wave can solve. If you are going to go for a gate model, I think you have to understand how linear algebra works because quantum computing relies on linear algebra. And um, in order to verify any of your results, if, you, you know, if you're making a program and you're saying, okay, I want to verify what I'm doing, you would almost have to understand how linear algebra works. So you can, you can do the same steps in linear algebra. Um, so I mean, it can, it can get complicated depending on what you're doing, what your goal is. And I agree with what Terrell is saying and what Matthew is saying about, you know, just getting in and starting with something and then learning the, the coding, the Dirac mutations, the Hilbert space and things as you go along. Because I mean, there, there's a lot to learn. I mean, I'm... Yeah amazing how much in how much I've had to learn over the last year and a half <laughs> I would not I mean like I would don't even know how would I, I if I would have started had I known the amount of information I would have to get into think think of it think of it as really just-in-time learning right so you could take someone along a path and and you know when they run into that roadblock oh it's like you know for example right now I'm not paying attention to you know, ion traps and all that. That's just noise to me until I start writing on a IBM machine and a Honeywell machine or whatever. Then, I, then I'm going to care. But right now, protons, electrons, that's just noise because I, where I am in, in learning. But eventually, hopefully, I'll get to the point where I care 
then I'm going to do a deep dive in what that's all about. Right now, we're just kind of, you know, if you look at the MIT courses, for example, which, which is good. I mean, it gets you in the game, but but everything's all batched up. And so instead of just thinking at math or physics and all that, it's, it's a process and, uh, you know, you learn it when you need it to get to the next spot. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's that's what what I'm trying to do here uh, over, over time. I think that's key. So, uh, anyway. what are your thoughts? Any more any more questions from the from the greater greater group? Hey, Matt, I don't know when is your IPO coming up for Optum. I'm sorry. Can you say it again? You were breaking up. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, on a lighter note, uh, is the is the IPO coming up for Optum? Oh, the IPO. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, but I do know this. I mean, we are we have an active uh, patent protection uh, department um, that is engaged in that space, and we are tied to the hip with them. They are watching our every movement in this space in anticipation of. Um, of generating a lot of patents in that space. You'd be surprised how easy it is to get a patent these days. Um, I wouldn't say that every monkey flying from a tree could get one, but it's it, when you get your first one, and I've got my name on on, on one already uh, that's that's out for review. Um, yeah, at the end of that process, you go, really? Is that all it took? Yeah. So, you know, um, but it allows corporations to, 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 uh, to exercise the greater market, and so we're We've got those folks uh, with us to watch over what we're doing, help us out, and uh, whatever we can generate, they'll be very happy to start running the finish line with that. So we've got support in this space, and so um, we're looking forward to trying to get in there and slug it out. All right, folks. Oops. Got some, uh, yeah. some background noise there. All right, last call. Thank you, Matt. It's yeah, been, all of you. It's been a it's wonderful been a, experience. It's been a pleasure serving um, in all of this, and uh, uh, let's do this again. Uh, I appreciate every. I, it, it's a real privilege to actually connect with all these great folks that uh, that I see on LinkedIn in this space, and uh, and and add something to the greater good. So, um, privilege to be here. Maybe we can get you back in some shape or form for Quantum Quantum Appalooza 2021. We'll have we'll have moved the ball then. Yes, hopefully yeah. we'll have something of value to to, uh, to to get to the greater good. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks, right. Terry, also to organize all these things. Uh, I was just using Meetup for soccer, and one sudden day I found that there's a Quantum group going up. So I just joined it, and thanks to that you organized this. It's, it's a real wonderful thing that happened yeah well it's, you guys are coming that's why it's wonderful <laughs> so all right well there'll be plenty more coming up in the future a lot more right. learning to do matt, you know matt just started the the ball on most of us so all right guys ladies Hi. have a good weekend thanks again matt you guys are very welcome. Thank you for everything. Glad that uh, you could come here and, and more glad to be able to help out the greater good. All right. I don't know how we can repay it, but we'll figure something out. We'll all, right. all right. First person to create an algorithm, name it after Matt. How about that? Here we go. That's, all that's, right. That's, that's, that's the, the Rani algorithm. That Thanks, can everyone. Bird right. algorithm. <laughs> yeah, there's too many syllables there. All right. Take care, yeah. everybody. All right. Ciao. Bye. Bye.